back and then it might welcome be or... welcome back. We are Adam and Morgan, your online host today. Thank you for Shushing tuning in and head. joining with us. Where would they be tuning in from, Morgan? Okay, here we go. You're either watching YouTube. One. Boom. You're watching our website, Freedom House Aussies. That's right. Live. Or Facebook. That's right. And what do we want them to do? All the Jump lovely in people the chat that are out there. And tell us where you're at because this is the online lobby. So that we want to hear from you. We don't want to just be, you know, looking at a screen um, and just, and talking, just to talking to each other, which we do because all the time, and we're great at it. I'm, ta but I'm talking about talking to myself. I'm great at oh. that too. <laughs> uh, so I'm not when sitting in the car though, and I think like, I think like when I'm singing, I'm like, I wonder. I people probably presume that, but otherwise, I look like I'm just like. <laughs> Anyways, I can just digress. Uh, sit in silence. I know. Sometimes yeah. after a long day of work, I can too. Actually, it's like when you get home from a long day and you turn the car off and it's just like silent because there's almost like a ringing in your ears. You're like, ah. Uh, you better have tinnitus, but you know, either we'll way, get that nice. checked out. <laughs> okay, so make sure you jump in the chat is what we're saying because yeah, we want to hear from you. Hey, my chat says something went wrong. Let's try uh -oh. again. Oh, now it's Hopefully not. Hopefully, the other people's didn't. I'm on no, our website, freedomhouse.cc/live. And so Hi, Kathy. We'd love to hear from you. Say hello to you. Good morning. Bless up. beyond belief. Yay. Bless. Be I'm Hashtag so blessed. blessed. That's a cute song. Um, yeah. Okay. Reloading. So here are the here's the big hitters. What's the new what's, series? Oh yeah, yeah. We're starting off new stuff today. So last week, if you didn't know, was Easter Sunday. Phenomenal, amazing weekend. You should all watch around. it back. You should. It was it's on great. YouTube. But our we are starting a new series. Today. We previewed it a little bit last week. So. Um, we're excited. Did you yeah. want to tell, say what it was? No, it's called By His Stripes. It's going to be so good. Pastor Olin's in the house today to kick it off. Pastor Olin. And Teacher we're happy Pastor. about love that because we love that here. whole family. I love that whole family. The Carters, yep. Okay. They're going to be here hanging out with us. So, this has. A, I have a question for everyone. Which I'm going to ask it now with th two minutes and 58 seconds. Boom. So basically has nothing three to do. Three minutes. I can't segue it from Pastor Olin because I don't okay. know. We're maybe maybe this will be a, a segue. Series. Basically, what we're saying is pay attention. Pay attention. down. So, Pastor Olin probably listens to music. This is my segue. Oh, it's about music. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> okay. So, um, this is the question I have for you. That. It comes from yesterday. What? That was a terrible segue. You know, Correct. It's, funny it's like, how like, can I correlate two you things? You can segue that with anything and be like, this person's probably heard of music before. Speaking Let's of music. Let's talk about music. <laughs> um, anyways, what? This came from yesterday because um, I had my baby shower yesterday. I don't know if you can't tell, but we're out here. Um... Anyways, I had a lot of oldies in there. So this is... A couple of throwbacks. Yeah, and just stuff that takes you back. And so here's the question. Decade and genre that takes you back. It oh, just throw it's like It's like one that creates nostalgia for Ooh, you. Maybe you mine. grew up on it. Maybe it was playing... For me, I had some songs in there that reminded me of like my early childhood where my mom would be cleaning in the living room and like have... It was probably 70s music on. I think that's the genre yeah. was 70s. And it was just like, it just gives me the nostalgia feeling. So decade, genre. I have a few, but go ahead. You so first. I, one, one for both of us is like throwback country. 90s country. Like 90s country, early 2000s country. Um, uh, I think the, th there, the nostalgia like is the 90s part. There, what's so funny is like there's one song in particular that I can think of that was around when we were growing up that I could not stand. And like, I, I vividly remember thinking, Don't I can't wait here. for the, this. The I'm artist is watching. I know. And uh, we're, we, we're great friends. We're so I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't know what we're him. talking about. But uh, I could not wait for this song to not be popular anymore because on the radio, it, it just was playing all the time. Like every so hour. So what's your, uh, and also Stacy, Stacy and Asher. Hi, you're from, oh, in Georgia, baby, go dogs. Georgia. Um, here Decade, genre, nostalgic music for, music for you. 90s country is definitely one for us. 90s country is definitely one. Like early 2000s, like punk. I knew he was gonna say that. It's like because like the whiny rock. Like let me know that I've done wrong. Like that. Yeah, it's like yeah, all American rejects stuff like that. I'll give you my yeah. So that that one definitely definitely throws throws you back. That's funny. And it's so 90s R and B too though. Some of that hits. I didn't really listen to Or like 2000s. Yeah, but I'm thinking like Mariah Carey. Um, well, that was, you know. We have a producer, Nick, who's behind the camera, and we have uh, we have some similar tastes in like old school, Kristen, like Christian Decade, rock stuff. genre, takes you back. He and Bradley, throw it in for the chat. one of our, our youth events one day, and he threw on some old like Family Force 5. And I was like, yeah, come on, Nick. All right, hey, throw it in the chat. We love you. Happy <laughs> Sunday. Enjoy service. Enjoy this new series. It's going to be great. It's going to be so good. 
Freedom House, what's going on? Stand up on your feet. It's time to worship. If you're joining us online, welcome to church. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. That stood in our way But he came And he died And he rose Those giants are dead now We're gonna sing This is our God This is our God This is who he is He loves us And this is our God This is what he does He saves us He brought the cross a wonder working, a miracle working God. Let's sing about his goodness together, one voice. The one who made the blind to see is moving here in front of me, moving here in front of me. The one who made the deaf to hear. Come on, church. Is silencing my every fear, silencing my every fear. Sing, 
because of that small thing from last week that I prayed about you came through. Come on, church, I want to hear it. 
God, I believe in you because I've seen barren wombs conceive. God, I believe in you because I've seen things happen the doctors can't explain. God, I believe in you. Do this for me, close your eyes, close your eyes. I want you to just from the depths of your soul, all at once say, God, I believe in you. Father God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love that you pour on us unconditionally. Thank you for your comfort, your compassion. Father, we believe in you. We believe in your power. We believe in your, your freedom that you provide. We believe in your transformation power. God, sometimes though, it can be hard. And, and like the, the father whose son you cast a demon out, Lord, sometimes just bring us to the point where we say, I believe, help my unbelief. Lord, open every single person's eyes in here to your goodness, to the God who can work miracles this morning, Lord. Amen. Well, every service we like to give you an opportunity to receive prayer. So leaders, please come and make your way forward. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter and Jesus' victory over sin and death. And what does that mean practically for us? Well, it means that since he's alive, you can have faith that he's a God who keeps his word and fulfills his promises. You can have faith that he's working in your circumstances. You can have faith that he's going to perform miracles in your life. And your faith, it doesn't need to be as big as the Red Sea or as strong as Goliath. It can be as, as small as Zacchaeus. You remember him, the wee little man who climbed up the tree to just get a glimpse of Jesus? Or about the boy who gave his lunch. And I just want you guys to know that God is here. And there might be something you're struggling with in your life. You need his peace. You need his hope. You need physical healing. And you can't answer your own prayers. I don't know if you know that, but you can't. But he can. He can. Anything that's on your mind, he can answer it. And so come forward. You might not feel like you have any, any faith at all, but come forward. Because these leaders here, they're your friend. They're gonna carry you to Jesus so you can receive from him what you need right now. Let's continue to worship. We're gonna sing this new song today. Sometimes we can get caught up in our own brain and in our own mind and, and we can lose the sight of the fact that we serve a God who heals. And so this song reminds our souls that we do serve a God that heals. So Luke's gonna be on the screen behind me. Let's sing this out. When did I start to forget and all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? Or how did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Oh, you are more than able. Send it out, come on. Oh, you are more.
is an encouragement. That song, I, I think you should put that on your playlist, like heart it, favorite it, because that should be an encouragement to you, not to stay defeated. You know, even when David had to deal with everything that he de dealt with, with Saul coming after his life, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And that's exactly what we have to do if we are going to have the faith to believe that anything is possible. And this month, we're doing a series called By His Stripes. And it's it, like everything is possible with God. Nothing's impossible with God. And I know that we're gonna see miracles happen in our services all throughout all of our campuses and online this month as we decide to be in the house of the Lord. I'm believing for the impossible to become possible because God's involved, are you? Make sure you're in church every weekend. And not only that, but we can believe for bigger and higher things. I believe that anything is possible. I believe that when the church body comes together, not just Freedom House Church, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Christians all over the place. We can change the country. We can take our country back. And today, when we combine our faith with those who are of faith, that are running for office, we can take this country back if the Christians will just stand. So today we have Hal Weatherman running for Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina here with us today. We're gonna go ahead and have him come up. We wanna pray over him today. We wanna hear from him today and why you should cast your vote for truth and righteousness in Jesus' name. Hal, it's a blessing having you here. Could you give us just a couple highlights of what you're standing for in the midst of all the battles that we're seeing right now? Well, I would describe myself as a limited government, constitutional Christian conservative. I've been married for 20 years to my wife, Shelly. We have three teenage kids. I have certain fundamental beliefs that drive my life, drive this campaign, and will govern how I govern if I'm elected. I believe that all mankind has fallen and in need of God's redemptive grace, and that grace is freely given through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, whom I profess. I believe that the family unit, the family is the basic building block of this society. Amen. And the family unit right now in this society is under assault in every room that you walk into. The boardroom, the courtroom, the classroom, the hospital room, right? If I have the honor and the privilege to be your Lieutenant Governor, I pledge that I will stand up for our families every day and I will fight the woke agenda, whether it's CRT, DEI, SEL, all these three letter acronyms are just the DNA of the woke agenda, broken into its component parts, tied into federal funds. And I'm a limited government conservative, so it pains me to say this. I actually believe that the government is ordained by God himself. That government on all levels is there to provide order and discipline and stability for our people, honestly, so that the end goal is so that the gospel of Jesus Christ can be openly preached freely in this country. Come on. Right? That's what I believe. But uh, I just, I really want to, um, it pains me to say this. The number one perpetrator in today's world of the ideologies that are dividing us as a people is actually our federal government. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe the salvation of our country is gonna come from Washington, I don't. I actually believe it's gonna come from electing constitutional Christian conservatives at the governor and lieutenant governor level. Good. And I humbly good. ask for your support in my efforts. So good. So good. So let's talk about May 14th, what's happening. Yeah, give us the dates uh, and tell us exactly what's going on. Right, so uh, I'm, I'm running to be your lieutenant governor. I'm a Republican, and we had a primary just a, a couple of weeks ago. In an 11-man field, we came out on top. But the number two finisher did call for a runoff, which is his right to do so. That runoff election is May 14th. And so I ask that you go out and vote. If I was your first choice, by all means, please go out and vote again. If I was not your first choice, I want you, you know my heart. I've, I've tried to share with you my heart, but I also want to, I'll end with this. I want you to know this. I was the only one of those 11 candidates who went to all 100 counties. We went to all 100 counties. I've been on the road with no exaggeration. I've been on the road continuously, five days a week, for 15 straight months for the honor and the privilege to serve you. And so I ask that you remember that when you go into the, the ballot box. Who took the time to go? We went to all 100 counties. We went to 35 counties five times or more. We went to 10 counties 10 times or more. We've done enough travel to circumvent the state two times, and we're just getting started. But I consider it great joy. It's a sacrifice, yes, but I consider it an amazing joy and honor to travel this great state and spend all day, every day, 
meeting with our state's greatest asset, which is our people. And I've learned, I've learned it is more important, not what's coming out of my mouth. And I pray for this every day. I pray before every meeting, every interview, every phone call, that God would give me eyes to see and ears to hear what the person is saying to me. Our country is begging. It's yearning. By the way, yearning is a biblical term. It means to get back what you know intuitively you've lost. Our country is yearning for authentic, genuine candidates who just want to relate to a person. Every person that I have met around this great state has a story. Every one of them has something they're trying to break free of. My favorite quote is not even a biblical quote. It's, it's actually Henry David Thoreau. He said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. The, the mass of people on this earth live a daily struggle of desperation. We know what they're really looking for, right? They're looking for Jesus. In some small way, if I have the honor and the privilege to be your lieutenant governor, I want to free people. I want to free people from what is holding them back. I want to reveal to them by relating to them exactly where they are with no judgment. Amen. I want to relate to them where they are and say there is hope. I hope that makes sense. That's Amen. what's driving Amen. me. Amen. Come on. Come on. I want you guys to think about something real quick. If we get Mark Robinson as governor, if we get Hal as lieutenant governor, we can make a difference. We can be a catalyst Come for this on, country. Come on, North Carolina. We need God-fearing, good Christian men in office so we can turn this country around. If you would, extend your hands out. We're going to pray over Hal. Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, Lord. We just lift up Hal to you in his entire um, campaign, God. Lord, you know what he faces on a daily basis, God. But, Lord, I pray that he would uh, be able to get the ear of people. And, Lord, that they would cast the votes that are needed to put godly people into office, Amen. Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that you would just move miraculously on this state. Lord, that you'd put the, the God-fearing people into office, Lord, that would bring about change that we need. And Lord, we just thank you for it. Lord, we pray for hedge of protection around him. We pray for boldness. We pray for courage. We pray for protection around his family and all the people that are with him. And so, Heavenly Father, we just give you praise for it today. Lord, we lift you up. You are our number one priority. And Lord, we'll let that shine through in everything that we do, from the voting polls all the way to what we're doing on a Sunday morning service. We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Hal. Give it up for him one more time. Well, we are going to continue our worship service, and our senior pastors have a very special message for anyone who's new to Freedom House. So as you're having a seat, say a hello to the person beside you, and then turn your attention to the screens for the preview. We are Troy and Penny Maxwell, your senior pastors right here at Freedom House. Our mission here is to equip people to experience Christ's freedom in their everyday lives. We are one house with many rooms. So welcome to everyone at our Central, South End, and Lake Norman campuses. And also to those of you who are watching through our online experience at our online campus. And if today is your first time here, we are fired up to have you with us. We'd love to get to know you, so tap the button on the back of the seat in front of you with your phone and follow the prompts on the screen. Then stop by Guest Central after service because we've set aside a special gift just for you. So here's a look at what's coming up here at Freedom House. Water baptism is an outward expression of an inward commitment to follow Jesus and we wanna celebrate you being made free through baptism. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are made free. And so if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, this is your personal invitation to make a public declaration through water baptism and to begin to walk in the new life that you've been given through Jesus. Now, baptisms are April the 14th at South End and Lake Norman and April the 21st at Central Campus. So don't wait another minute to be made free and register today at freedomhouse.cc slash baptism. TPUSA Faith at Freedom House is dedicated to promote civic engagement and to provide opportunities to make positive political and cultural change in our nation. Now, our goal is to reach out and to educate those in our community by hosting monthly Freedom Nights, holding voter registration events, and inviting impactful speakers to speak and to provide insight. 
So join us for our next Freedom Night on April the 9th at 7 p.m. at our central campus. It's featuring a screening of Eric Metaxas's new documentary called Letter to the American Church. This film brings to life the importance of the church's involvement in political and cultural aspects. We'll see you there. For all of this and more, you can simply tap the button on the back of the seat in front of you with your phone, or you can download the Freedom House app. Well, hello, Freedom House. Welcome. We are so glad you guys have joined us today, Sunday morning, just the week after Easter. And come on, can we get a He is risen out of you? One, two, One three. Come on. That's right. He didn't go anywhere else. He stayed risen. That's right. <laughs> Hey, uh, this is the point of service where we're going to continue to worship God with the receiving of our tithes and our offerings. Uh, tithe is simply 10% of our gross income that we return to God, and an offering is anything above and beyond that. And we call those people kingdom builders. Come on. And as a matter of fact, today we're receiving our monthly kingdom builders give, and that is uh, people who have come together that said, you know what, I want to see the vision of Freedom House go outside of these four walls and affect our community. So there are ways to give here at Freedom House. You want to share those? Yeah. So it's real simple. All you have to do is open your phone, tap the decal on the seat in front of you, and you can give online that way. You can also give by cash or check by using the envelope in the seat back pocket and then drop it in the giving containers located in the lobby for after service. All right, so we have a story for you today. So I want you to listen up. This is a story that you may be familiar with. In 2001, God was working on a plan. To enact his plan, he called a couple from Richmond, Virginia to Charlotte, North Carolina to start a church. That couple was none other than our senior pastors, Troy and Penny Maxwell. That's right. In 2002, they packed up everything they had, all their belongings, everything. their small, three small children, and moved to Charlotte to start Freedom House. Freedom House started in elementary school. The church offices were actually in their bonus room above their garage. <laughs> In their house. In their house. They actually brought the kids' toys to Freedom House every weekend so there would be things to do in the kids' classrooms. Isn't that wild? Listen, Freedom House started out with like 67 people at their first service. And it exploded their second service all the way back down into the 30s. <laughs> what happened yeah. is everybody came down from Richmond to help them start the church. They decided to go back home. And then Troy and Penny started off with very humble beginnings and started Freedom House. So despite these humble beginnings, they would gather every Tuesday night with their team and they would pray. They would seek God's vision and they would pray and write down the divine pictures that God gave them. Well, I want you to hear one of these divine pictures because this is profound. What they saw was a vision of people positioned on scaffolding around a building. Now the people in this vision were like those that Nehemiah recruited to rebuild broken lives and to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the building in the vision represented the church that we now know as Freedom House that they and the people were called to build that we're still building today. What they really saw is they saw one team with one dream, and that's to build God's house and watch people get set free miraculously. We, we, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Freedom House Dream Come Team. On. That's what we're talking about. And today we want to share a video with you that Pastor Troy and Penny did. And they just want to share their heartfelt thanks for all that the Dream Team does. Check Let's this check out. Check it out. Dear Dream Team, you may not know this, but we've been watching you. You figured out what you do best and have offered your talents and abilities to our Freedom House family and to our Father. You are one team with one dream. You've been generous with your time. You've been faithful with your energy and have sown in secret. You show us how to serve well and fill it to the brim. You step up and stay the course even when things get hard. You set the table with excellence before others arrive and you clean up after everyone has left. You choose to give when you could be receiving. You choose to help when you could be helped. You don't expect an award, but you make your offering a reward of its own. You extend the Father's love to those who really need it. You constantly wash the feet of those around you. You walk out your calling as a son or daughter because at the end of the day, you understand what it means to be one team with one dream. 
thank you, Freedom House Dream Team, for your faithful service to God's house. We love being your pastors. Love, Pastors Troy and Penny. Come on! Come on, give it up. As a matter of fact, if you're part of that one team with one dream and you're currently serving on the Freedom House Dream Team, we want to, you guys to stand up because we want to give you some honor. Come on, Come on. everybody stand up. Come on, if you currently up. serve, whoever currently serves. All right. You guys make church happen every single week. and We love you so, so, so much. So hold up, hold up, remain standing because I have something I want to share with you. You are the vision that Pastors Troy and Penny had 23 years ago and you have done more than they have ever thought possible. And we just wanna give it up for you because lives are changed each and every weekend because you come to sacrifice your time so that other people can be served. We're so proud of you, we're so thankful for you, and we know that this dream would not be possible without you at the helm. We love you, thank you so much. Come on, give it up for our dream team one more time. And we have something very special for them today, don't we? Yes, after service, stop by Guest Central. Not Guest Central. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the Connect Lounge across, across the hall, Connect Lounge. <laughs> stop by there because we have a sweet treat for you and we also have a gift that we just want to put in your hands because we have so much thankfulness in our hearts for everything you guys do. People's lives, whew, whew, thousands of people every single year come through these doors and their lives are impacted. Yeah. By you. We don't talk to all of them. Pastor Troy and Penny don't talk to all of them. You guys are the face of Freedom House. Wow. So many people. Let that sink in, man. I can't even tell you how many thousands of people whose lives have changed. Their hearts have changed. Their destinies have changed. Yeah, their families have changed. Because of the Dream Team. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. So we have to continue the service. Yeah, I, I know, you're going, in a moment. But why don't you go ahead and pray? <laughs> Pray we're going to pray. Father, thank you so much for our dream team. God, we're asking for blessing to be poured out from the windows of heaven, poured out on their lives, poured out on their families. God, you said that you would bless those who sacrifice, those who serve. And so we're asking for blessing and favor on your people. God, we thank you for them in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. We are going to continue the rest of the service with our new message series called By his stripes, you need to check this out. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I'm loud, but I'm not that loud, so I'm probably going to need a microphone today. You guys doing great today? Man, it's so good to be in God's house. Are y'all ready to experience some healing? Man, by his stripes. Come on. Anybody excited to hear about healing? Yeah, yeah. I think it's something that we all wonder about or curious about. How many of you, just show of hands, how many of you have ever experienced healing, God's healing in your life? Raise your hand if you've ever been. Look at that. Look at that. Look around the room. So many people have experienced God's healing absolutely incredible. Well, my name is Olin Carter. I serve here on our teaching team, and that is the greatest honor and privilege of my life. Uh, if I have never had the pleasure of meeting you, I'll be around after service. would love to shake your hand. And you guys have the greatest campus pastors in the world. Give it up for the Blantons right here. You guys stand up. They're your campus pastors. If you haven't met them, make sure if you're new here, you meet them after service today. And before I jump in, too, I want to make sure that we 
uh, welcome and, and uh, recognize our online campus. We have people tuning in right now from all over the world. We have people from Georgia, South Carolina, New Jersey, Kentucky, Maine, New York, Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Florida, Colorado, the Philippines, and Peru. You guys give it up for them. It's awesome. So glad you guys are with us today. So as we've talked, you know, we are entering a new series called By His Stripes. What is this series all about? We're going to be answering the most important questions about healing from God's Word. We're going to be looking into the Word of God to, to put away the myths, the religious uh, phrases, maybe things we've been taught or maybe mistaught. Maybe things that aren't true. Maybe things that are holding us back from God's healing. We're going to bring you the truth from God's word. And aren't you glad that we serve a healing God? Aren't you glad? God is not just a healer. He is the healer. He is the healer. Not, not just for physical things, but he is the healer for our emotions, for our spiritual infirmity. Man, it, by his stripes we are healed, and that's for everything, right? It encompasses every part of who we are. You know, in the last few years, both my wife and my mother have had battles with cancer. I've talked about that a few times, more with my wife than my mom. And, and I currently take medicine. Those of you who have known me for a long time, um, I used to, to struggle quite a bit with, with a sickness called gout. Anybody ever heard of gout? Man, it stinks. I would use a different word, but I'm in church. <laughs> gout is awful. Man, it is painful. And, you know, we all go through sicknesses, infirmities in our life. But yet, even though we struggle through that, I know I personally have experienced and witnessed great miracles of physical, emotional, and spiritual healing in my life. But why don't we see more miracles of healing? Why don't we see it more often? Why don't we see it every single time? Why isn't everyone healed? Why do some healings take longer than others? Ever seen a healing take place, but it doesn't happen like that? Maybe some of us have experienced that and we were healed, but it took a process in our life. You ever wonder about that? God, this stinks. I'm in pain. Why can't you just make this go away now? Like we want it now, right? Now is better than later when it comes to healing. Can I get an amen? I'm not setting you up. That's truth. If you're in pain, you want to be healed today. Not next Thursday, you want it now, right? So let's look at what God's word has to say about this. There's an amazing story in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. If you want to turn there, if not, they're going to put it on the screens for you. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. It says, And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes, that's different, and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. Man, he spit on that man's eyes. Now, I'm going to need a few volunteers this morning. <laughs> Who wants to raise their hand? Come on, come on, you got a four. Okay, everybody relax. I'm not going to spit on anybody today. Nobody's getting spit on today. But there's a lot we can learn from this passage. There's a lot we can learn from this. So let's, let's break it down. Number one, we see that they brought the man to Jesus. They brought the man to Jesus. And did you know the number one reason why people aren't healed is because they don't ask? That's the truth. The number one reason why people aren't healed is because they don't ask. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who is sick has failed to pray for healing. There are times where people have prayed, and we're going to get to that in a minute. What do we do in those situations? But let's start here. Are you believing to be healed? When you're sick, do you pray? I remember years ago, there was this gentleman that used to come to my old church, and he spoke a lot on healing, and um, he brought this up one time, and he said, 
You know, when we have a head cold, when we have allergies, when we have little things like that, you know, do you take that to God and ask God to heal you? Because so often we don't. And he said something very profound. He said, if you have a head cold, if you have a headache, and you say, well, you know, I'm not going to bring this to God. He said, then Jesus took those stripes for you in vain. Do you want to waste the suffering that Jesus went through for your healing? But yet many times, I know me myself, I have something small, I think I'm getting the flu, I've got, you know, a cold, I've got a headache, and I don't even think about praying, right? We just go straight to the Advil, the Tylenol, the doctor, whatever it may be. Number one reason why people aren't healed is because they don't ask. They brought this blind man to Jesus. Why? Because they had hope. Do you have hope? Do you have hope that Jesus can heal you? Do you have hope... An earnest expectation of good that if you go to God, if you pray to God, if you bring it to God, that something might change. Or have you lost hope? That's where healing starts. There must be hope that something is better, something better is possible. That the impossible is possible. That hope starts with Jesus. When we need healing, the first thing we need to do is shift our focus from our sickness to our healer. Years ago, when I was really young, I played basketball a lot, and I hurt my knee really, really bad. I I got tangled up with this guy. We both went up in the air, landed on my knee. My kneecap went to the side. Yeah, it was fun. And as a young kid, you know, I was all about sports and riding my bike and playing basketball. And for the whole summer, I had this leg, this whole leg brace on. I was on crutches. Um, which was hilarious, by the way, if you ever do that, when you take the leg brace off, you got one big leg and one skinny leg, which is hilarious. When you look in the mirror, you're like, oh, my gosh. But, man, I was miserable. My leg hurt so much. I mean, my knee was just all kind of messed up. I went to the doctor. The doctor told me, he said, your, your, car, your knee, when it went over, it severed some of the cartilage, and that cartilage is like floating behind your kneecap. And so certain times when I would bend my leg, the cartilage would get stuck where the leg or the kneecap was supposed to bend, and it would just lock up. And so sometimes I would sit down, and I couldn't get up. My leg would just be stuck. And so I was scheduled to have surgery on my knee. I go to this healing service, and the minister that was was there is praying for people and stuff like this, and he calls out and he says, Hey, somebody here has got an issue with your knee. You're really young. And the doctor even said that this type of injury is unusual for someone your age, which is everything the doctor had told me because I started getting arthritis, uh, early tendonitis, and he was like, it's really crazy for you this young to have this, but you have this. So this man is saying this stuff, and I'm just sitting here like, you know, I wonder who he's talking about. (laughs) Man, whoever this is should like raise their hand or something, right? And then all of a sudden, my lightning fast mind kicked in, and I thought, you know what? He could be talking about me. And he said, here's what the Lord said. Stop worrying about your healing and focus on the healer. And I just began to focus on Jesus, and he said, just bend down and put your hands on your knees. And I said, well, I've never done this before, but it's worth a shot, you know. And I bent down, I put my hands on my knees, and all of a sudden, I felt a heat come from the bottom of my feet, go all the way up through my body, and I never had surgery. I've never had knee pain since that time. God totally healed my knee. And I think there's something when we stop focusing on the pain, stop focusing on the issue, stop focusing on the sickness, and just look at Jesus. Just focus on Jesus. When we focus on Jesus... Hope comes alive. That hope might be dead in your heart today. Maybe you're in here and you think, man, I've been wanting to be healed for 20 years. Listen, I'm not even here to tell you that Jesus is going to heal you today. I I believe he can. But my goal today in prayer for this service is I, I think there are many of you in here that you've lost hope for your healing. And I just want to stir it up. I just, this is my goal today. I just want you to start doubting your doubts. I just want to poke some holes in that hopelessness, that doubt that has crept in and convinced you that God no longer heals, 
that there's no hope for you. That, well, I prayed before and I haven't experienced it. I haven't seen it. I haven't felt it. I'm still in pain. I'm still taking medicine. I still can't see. I still can't hear. I still can't walk. Whatever it may be, I just want to poke little holes of doubt. And I want you to leave here today just thinking, what, what if maybe, I don't know. Maybe Jesus, I don't, maybe, I don't, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he can. I, maybe, maybe it's possible. I just want you to leave today with a little bit of hope. This doesn't mean that we ignore our pain or pretend we're not sick. I've been in churches that teach that, that kind of live that out. And if you say, you know, well, I'm not feeling good today. Oh, watch your confession. You better zip it. Don't you say you've got the flu. Don't say it. Like by you acknowledging you feel bad, you've canceled God's power to heal you. Can I tell you, they brought the blind man to Jesus, and it was understood he was blind. Right? They didn't bring him and say, would you just touch him? There's something wrong. We don't want to say it. <laughs> He's just looking around because he likes the sky, and, you know, you know, we don't want to pronounce it, you know, and cancel out your power, Jesus. No, they said, hey, he's blind. Jesus, he needs your touch because he's blind. And when we're sick, we're sick. If you've got an ache, a pain, when my knee was hurt, guess what? My knee was hurt. And if you tried to tell me, well, if you just had faith, your knee wouldn't hurt. Well, I guess I ain't got faith because my knee hurts. I can feel it right now. There's pain in my knee. Shut up. Tell me my knee don't hurt. I'll smack you upside the head and see if your head hurts. That's just stupid, right? And nothing in the Bible that says you can't say when you're sick. You can't acknowledge you're in pain. It means that we open our eyes to actually see and understand the spiritual reality. We know what's happening in the physical because we've got pain to confirm what we think is happening in the physical. But what we need to see and understand is what is happening in the spiritual. See, when we read Mark chapter 7 and 8, you got to go back, you got to get some context. It really helps you understand the power of this story. We see a few things. We see a recurring theme of spiritual blindness in what Jesus calls hardness of heart. Now, I'm going to preach today a little bit, and I don't want to hurt y'all's feelings, but I, I'm going to accuse us some, of some stuff that we're guilty of. And listen, I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to me because I do it all the time. And sometimes, listen, we're guilty as Christians, as believers, of having a hard heart. We get spiritually blind sometimes. I know, Central Campus, y'all are the most spiritual. I get it. But you do it too. Sometimes we struggle to really stand in our faith and, we, and see in the spiritual realm. We get what Jesus calls a hard heart. See, in chapter 7, we see this contrast between the religious leaders that Jesus rebukes, so he just wears them out, because they're being religious, they're being hypocritical, and there's this story that I've actually preached on before of the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was possessed by a demon. The religious, and even Jesus' own disciples, can't see with spiritual understanding, but this Gentile woman can. She's an outcast. To the Jews, she is lower than the low. Jesus calls this woman a dog. Now, I ain't going to have time to break that down for you, but you can go on YouTube. I preached on it once, so don't freak out. Jesus was not being mean. But this woman can see better, more clearly in the spiritual realm than Jesus' own disciples. And so you have the men, the crew, that are walking around with Jesus, seeing his miracles each and every day. You have the religious leaders who have memorized the Torah. They've got the first five books of the Bible memorized. They can't see. But this lowly Gentile woman, she can see. She has spiritual understanding. The Pharisees put down Jesus' disciples because they're not focusing on the outward displays of Jewish, Jewish religious tradition. But the Gentile knows that she's unworthy. She didn't come to Jesus trying to prove how worthy she is. She didn't come to Jesus saying, you know, oh, look at my faith. Look how much I know. Look how much I am. Look, look how great I am. You, I deserve this healing. You should do this for me. No, she comes humble. She knows I'm unworthy. And she tells Jesus that even the crumbs from the master's table are more than enough to deliver my daughter. 
Jesus is astounded by this faith. This woman receives her miracle. Then we see Jesus right after this heal a deaf man in almost the exact same way that he heals the blind man. He spits. We're going to get into that in a minute. With one exception, the deaf man is healed instantaneously. So unlike the blind man, the deaf man is healed, but he hears right away. It's instantaneous. Then we see Jesus take seven loaves and a a few small fish and feed 4,000 people. Miracle after miracle. So after seeing Jesus rebuke the Pharisees, deliver the Gentile woman's daughter, heal the deaf man, feed the 4,000, what did the disciples do next? Did they preach an amazing message? Did they lay hands on people and see them raised from the dead? Did they walk on water? Did they do miracles? No. They stress out because they forgot to pack lunch. That's what they do. Their heart is so hardened that they can't see in the spirit that they're on the boat with Jesus freaking out because they forgot to put the bread in the boat. It says here in Mark chapter 8, verse 17, And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, "Uh, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not? yet understand. He is shocked by their hardness of heart. And this gives us so much context to our story today. The issue isn't the physical blindness any more than it was the lack of loaves and fishes. And the issue today is never the disease, the sickness, or the injury that we're suffering from. Your sickness, not the problem. It's not the issue. It's not an issue with God. It isn't the emotional scars, the trauma we've been through. Would it have been harder for Jesus to feed the 4,000 with five loaves instead of with seven? Would it have been tougher? What about with two? What about with one? What about if if there was just a crumb? Would that have been harder for Jesus to feed the 4,000 people? All we've got is a crumb. I mean, what's the difference if you've got a crumb or you've got five fish or three fish or seven fish if you got to feed 4,000 people? What's the difference? And what is the difference to God if you have a headache, a head cold, cancer, some kind of terminal disease, heart issues, blood issues, can't walk, can't see, can't hear? What difference does it make to God? There's no difference. It's not harder for God. It's not easier for God. It doesn't matter what kind of sickness you have, what kind of issue you have, what kind of problem you have. Is it emotional? Is it physical? We believe God to heal us spiritually, but yet for some reason sometimes it gets difficult for us to receive from God physically. And just like the disciples in this story, when I said, how many of us in here have experienced physical healing from God Hands went up all across the room. All across the room. In almost every aisle, every, up there, everywhere, hands went up. Everybody in the room saying, yep, I've seen it or I've experienced it. Yet, when the time comes for us to believe, sometimes we pull back. We go, well, I, I don't know if I could pray for that. Well, I don't know if God can heal that, and just like with the disciples, Jesus is like, well, everybody in the room just said you've seen me heal. What's the problem today? Why are you struggling to believe me today if you've seen me do it before? See, when you understand the true power and the grace of Jesus, like the Syrophoenician woman, the Gentile woman did, hope comes alive. And sometimes instead of just focusing on our doubt or focusing on our sickness or focusing on our pain, we just need to sit alone with Jesus and look at him. Just focus on what he's already done. Just begin to believe him for what he's already, praise him for what he's already done. It lifts faith in our heart. Hope begins 
to come alive. Let's think through how Jesus heals the blind man. Now, we already know that step one, they brought him to Jesus, right? So if we want to be healed today, if we want to be healed, we got to bring it to Jesus, right? Right? We're clear on that? So anybody in the room today, is anybody in the room today feeling bad, allergies, cold, sickness, headache, pain, back pain, anything? Anybody? Just lift your hand up. Anybody in the room? Okay. So we're all going to pray about it today, right? We're going to bring it to Jesus today, right? Because he can't heal us if we ain't brought it to him, right? So before we leave today, we're going to bring it to him, right? That's step one. We got to bring it to Jesus. So the people around this man, they brought him to Jesus with hope, hope in the healer. But he wasn't totally healed right away. That's the weird part of the story, right? He prayed, Jesus, Jesus. Because sometimes we get caught up in ourselves. Well, what if I lay hands or pray for somebody and they're not healed? Well, Jesus prayed for this man and he wasn't totally healed. So let's walk through it real quick. Did Jesus have the ability, the power to heal the man instantly? Who thinks yes? Raise your hand. Do you think yes? Did Jesus have the sufficient power from heaven to heal this man? Yes, right? That's an easy one, right? That's an easy question. We see Jesus heal the deaf man a few verses before. Instantly, he's healed right before this encounter. So we know it's not a power issue, right? There's no power shortage in heaven. And I think most of us are clear on that. I don't think that holds up a lot of healing. I don't think many people suffer for long periods of time, don't come to God for healing because they think heaven's out of power, right? Like, most of us get that. There, there's enough power. So here's the next question. Did Jesus desire to heal the man completely? Yes or no? Raise your hand if you think yes. Did Jesus desire to heal the man completely? Yes? I believe he did. I believe he did. Why do I believe that? Because the man ended up healed completely. If Jesus only desired partial healing in this man's life, because maybe some of us are thinking, well, God is healing me, but it's a process, and God just wants me to suffer for a little while longer. Maybe God doesn't want me to be totally healed, right? If Jesus didn't want this man to be totally healed, Jesus would have prayed for him. He would have spit on him, which we're going to get to that in a minute. we got to talk about the spit, right? <laughs> Jesus spit on him. Laid his hands on him, the man could partially see. If that was all Jesus wanted the man to receive, he would have said, hey, what, what can, can you see now? And the man said, well, yeah, I see people, but they look like trees. And Jesus would have said, all right, great. Have a great day. Good luck with that. And he left. That would have been it. If that's all Jesus wanted him to get, that's all he's getting, right? I don't think we're going to coax God into giving us something that's not in his will. Amen. So it was Jesus' desire to heal the man completely. All right? We can know that. So what did Jesus think? And now we're getting closer to the issue. What did Jesus think when the man responded that he wasn't completely healed? Think Jesus had a crisis of confidence? Think Jesus said, oh no, I must not be the Messiah. You think Jesus went, oh, man, that spitting trick always works. Man, let me down. You think that's what Jesus thought? Did Jesus begin to second guess himself, his methods? No, we don't, we don't believe Jesus second guessed himself. Okay, but then here's the question. When you're believing for something and you don't see it, experience it, feel it right away, what do you think? If Jesus didn't doubt, if Jesus didn't start questioning God, start questioning his mission, start questioning what was going on, if Jesus didn't pull back, why do we? Why when we pray for something and we don't see it, experience it right away, do we throw our hands up and quit and walk away? Jesus didn't quit. Jesus didn't say, well, I guess that's all you get today. Thanks for coming. No. No. Jesus leaned in to help the man receive. He didn't stop. He pressed in. He pressed in. Jesus laid his hands on the man again. Why? Did Jesus fail to release enough power the first time? The first time Jesus laid hands on the man, did Jesus mess up? Who thinks Jesus messed up? 
nobody. So Jesus released enough power. Jesus isn't freaking out that this isn't working, yet the man is not totally healed. What could possibly be the problem? Why would he lay hands on the man again? Was it to help the man maybe in receiving his full and complete healing? Why did Jesus spit in the first place? Let's talk about that. Why did Jesus spit? Because in that day and age, in their culture, spit or any kind of bodily fluid was ceremonially unclean. Okay? So if I accidentally spit on you, you had to go through a ritual of purification. Okay? Unless the spit came from a holy man. If the spit came from a healer, a rabbi, a priest, someone that the people accepted as having the gift of healing, then the spit, the saliva that came from that holy man's mouth was thought to have healing properties. And it was not only unclean, but it would raise the level of faith for the person to receive the healing. So why did Jesus spit on the man? Was it because Jesus needed to spit in order to heal the man? No, because we know Jesus has healed people, cast out devils, done all these other things simply by speaking a word. So Jesus doesn't need to do it, but maybe the man needs it in order to receive. So Jesus spits. Why? Because he knows it will connect the man with his faith and help hope to arise in his heart. So Jesus spits on the man. Why did Jesus take the man outside of the village? Did Jesus need to take the man outside of the village in order to heal him? No, because Jesus has healed people in villages before. We've seen Jesus heal people right in the middle of the temple. He's walked in, man, deformed hand, stretch your hand out, be healed. We've seen Jesus do all kinds of things. Jesus is teaching. They lower a man through the roof. Jesus heals him right there in front of everybody. So Jesus doesn't have... You know, he's not timid. He's not afraid of the crowd. Jesus doesn't need it. Maybe the man needed it. Maybe in order to help the man receive, he needed to draw him away from all the distractions of the people, from the doubt and unbelief of the people, so the man could focus on nobody but Jesus. So he wouldn't hear all the other voices, but he would hear the voice of the master. Whose voice are you listening to? Well, I'm sick. I got to go to Google. I got to go to WebMD. I got to call my friend the doctor. I got to call everybody. I got to find out what's wrong with me. I got to go. And listen, nothing wrong with going to doctors. I believe in doctors. Doctors are good. God uses doctors to heal us. But whose voice are we listening to? Whose voices are in our head? Is it lifting hope and faith in our heart? Because Jesus took the man outside the village for a reason. I believe the second reason is because Jesus was personal. He wanted to get right up close and personal. And listen, he wants to get personal with you today too. No matter what you're suffering through, listen, Jesus feels your pain. He understands your pain. He wants to sit with you in it. He wants to bring healing and joy and peace to you because he loves you. He's not a distant God. And that's why you don't need in order to get your healing. And sometimes as a connection connection point of faith, we come forward, and that's awesome, and we should do that. But you don't have to wait until Sunday in order to get your healing. Jesus is a personal Savior, and you can go to him for healing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You don't need me. You don't need the, the campus pastors. You don't need Pastor Troy. You don't need that friend of yours who really believes, no, Jesus loves you and wants to connect with you. He wants to take you outside of the village. He wants to take you away from all the distractions that's planting doubt and unbelief in your heart so that you can hear him, so you can experience your healing. Why did Jesus lay hands on him? Couldn't he have just spoken the word? No, but it was a point, a connection of faith. Sometimes when we do something, when we feel something, it just helps us to believe. Many Christians think, well, I prayed. God didn't heal me. I prayed. I still feel the pain. Oh, well. And I think maybe we should think, hey, I prayed. I haven't experienced the complete healing yet, so Lord, 
Help me to see with my spiritual eyes. Help me to receive the full and complete healing that you have for me. Remember one time at my old church, we had a tent meeting every year. And I had, to, I had a lot of responsibility there in tent meeting. I was running all over the place. And I had the worst headache. I mean, it was just this short of a migraine. I mean, my head was pounding. And the minister that week had been talking about healing. And I got in my car and I prayed and I said, God, Man, my head is hurting. Please, I have got so much to do. This is killing me right now. Like, please, God, heal my head. And my head just hurt worse. And I sat there and I prayed again. God, will you please heal my head? And my head just hurt worse. But I had, you ever have just one of those moments with God? One of those Jacob moments? I'm like, God, you're either the healer or you're not. And I'm not getting out of this car till I get my healing. And I just sat there and began to pray, and I got to a point where instead of praying for the healing, I started confessing, you know what, God? This is stupid, because I know you're a healer. I know you love me. I know you can heal me. I'm, I'm doing something, but I'm going to sit here till I receive it. And so I just begin to thank God. God, I thank you that I'm healed. God, I thank you that my head does not hurt. God, I thank you that I am whole in Jesus' name. God, I thank you. And I don't even remember how long it took me. I was sitting there. Somebody just saw me talking like thought I was an idiot for like 30 minutes in my car. But I'm going to tell you, at some point, and I don't even remember when it happened, I'm sitting here just thanking God, thanking God, thanking God. All of a sudden, my head stopped hurting. All of a sudden... And I'm going to tell you something, and, and this, is not, this is not thus saith the Lord, okay? I'm going to break from Scripture. This is Olin's opinion. Everybody with me? I don't want any nasty emails. You said that's, the, this, that's uh, not good theology. I'm just giving you my opinion, okay? I believe this is scriptural, but I, I, I can't prove it to you right now on the spot. I'm just going to share something from my heart with you, and you can take it or leave it. But when we talk about faith, when we believe God... I believe it works, okay? And sometimes I think we think we believe when maybe we haven't believed, okay? And I believe the moment, the moment, the moment I truly step into faith, I believe it happens. I believe sometimes we pray and God just moves dominoes and things are, man, he's just setting us up for blessing, but until we step into a moment of faith, I believe sometimes we just can't see it or experience it. That's what I believe. That's what I believe in my life. Now, I don't say that to condemn you because what some churches do is they put it on the people like, well, you're just not, you don't have enough faith. And it's not about what you do, it's about what he's done. You're not the healer. It's not our job to heal. I can't heal you, I can't heal myself. He's the healer. Is how we receive what he has for us is by faith. So I'm going to read you two passages of scripture. Next chapter in Mark, we see a demon-possessed boy brought to Jesus. Mark 9, verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if, the man's talking to Jesus, he says, but if you can do anything... Have compassion on us and help us. I love Jesus' response. And Jesus said to him, If? That's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. <laughs> Every time I read that, man, it just, it just I, I can see Jesus' face. If? Like, do you know who you're talking to right now? He says, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes immediately the father of the child cried out and said i believe help my unbelief help my unbelief look with me at james chapter one and this is verses five through eight it says if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask god who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him but let him ask in faith with no doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
See, we might think we might not have enough faith, but that's not the case. You have faith because the Bible says God has given you faith. So the issue is never that you don't have faith. The problem is not insufficient faith. The problem is impure faith. The problem is our faith is mixed with doubt. And faith mixed with doubt is not faith. Faith is relational. I've talked about this before. Faith is not science textbook. I see the evidence, therefore I believe. No, faith is relational. It's like I trust my wife because I love her and we have a relationship. It's trust. The Greek word pistis could just as easily be translated trust as it is faith. It's a relational faith. It's trusting in God. And so when we have doubt clouding our faith, it's not faith. I either trust my wife or I don't, right? That, that's, that's a relational trust. There's an element of faith in trusting someone that you have to say, well, I know based on their character how they're going to treat me and respond. I don't know for sure what my wife is doing, thinking, feeling 24-7 every day of the week, right? And you don't either. We don't know that of anybody. So we choose to trust based on their track record. So we choose to trust God, by the way, who has a perfect track record, who we, is the one person we can fully trust, but we choose to trust him. But here's the thing. All day, every day, we're walking around in a world that fills our heart with doubt. And so you're getting bombarded with doubt and unbelief constantly in the world. And so how can we have pure faith? How can we have moments where we actually believe God? Well, imagine for a second I have a pitcher of water up here. And the world is taking a little, a little dropper with black dye and is just dropping that black dye into that water, right? Because we all know that's the world we live in, right? TV, friends, news, everything we see is telling us God's not real. He doesn't heal. You can't trust him. Don't go to church. Be out for yourself. The Bible's not true. Doubt this, doubt that. Like constantly is dripping into our faith, muddying and mixing our faith so it's not pure trust in God. It's mixed with a little bit of doubt. Now here's the thing. When I've got a picture up here and I've dropped some of this this black dye, and let's say that dye is poisonous. You wouldn't drink out of that, would you? And how can I get it out? You can't scoop it out. It's dispersed into the water. You can't, you can't remove it that way, but there's one way you can get it out and be sure it's out. You can take another pitcher of water, or better yet, a hose pipe, and you can just pour water in so that the water overflows continually. You do that long enough, you'll get out all the dye and be left with nothing but pure water in the pitcher. That's what we have to do with our faith. We have to put enough word in us to flush out all the doubt that the world is putting in us all week long. If we want to receive from God on a consistent basis, we've got to have pure faith. We've got to get the doubt out. And so that means we can't have more Doubt coming in, then we have word and faith coming in because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we've got to pour in the word. I was talking to Dave Greco the other day. If y'all, y'all know Dave, he's on our board, a great, great man of faith. And he shared this amazing point with me. He said when he was saved, he was, he was praying about healing. And he said the Lord kind of spoke to him about this. And he was struggling to receive the healing. And God said, Dave, He said, when you were first saved, he said, the man shared the gospel with you. Remember the man? He said, yeah, I remember the man. He said, he shared his faith with me. He said, yeah, I remember he shared his faith with me. He said, how long did it take you to get saved? And he said, well, God, it took me about three months. The man shared his faith, prayed for me. We talked several times. I thought about it. He said, but really, it took three months for me to receive. And God says, God told him, he said, could you have received it earlier? Well, yeah. Yeah. I could have received it right away. And God said, it's the same thing with your healing. You received the word of salvation three months before, but you didn't believe it until you were ready to receive it. It took time for that word to germinate in your heart for you to believe it. Salvation is available to us. It's easy to receive, but yes, guess what? Healing is too. We just have to put the word into us And so we can receive. Now, what's the answer to all of this? What's the answer to maybe getting past a 
a struggle to receive from God, a partial healing, a healing you've been praying for, you haven't been experiencing, what's the answer? I bring you right back to where we started. You got to focus on Jesus. You got to look at Jesus. When you know Jesus, you will trust Jesus. When you study Jesus, you will see him as the healer. You got to let hope arise today in your heart. Don't believe the lie that you aren't worthy of healing, that you don't have the faith to be healed. We don't earn healing any more than we earn salvation. Healing is the children's bread. It's a promise for you. The word salvation in the Bible is a lot of times in English, I think we look at it like the word rescue, like God rescues us from hell. But the word that they use would much more closely be translated in English, not rescue, but restore or heal. Many times the word in the Greek that is used for saved is the same translated healed. It's the same word. And so when we're saved, we're healed. It's a process of healing. And every one of us in here today, just like this blind man, are in a process of healing. God is healing you from the sins and the, the issues you've had in your past. God is healing you emotionally from the hurts and the traumas of your past. God is healing you physically. We just have to believe. We have to receive that healing. See, here's the truth of this story, and I think this is what Mark was trying to point out through Mark chapter 7 and Mark chapter 8. The blind man could see better than the disciples or the religious leaders could. They had their eyes. They could see, but they were blind spiritually. They couldn't. Jesus just did all these miracles, and they couldn't see it. But the blind man could see because he had hope that Jesus could heal him. He saw that even though I'm blind, the power in this man is greater than my blindness. And if we want to be healed of something, we have to start there by realizing and understanding that the power of God is greater than my pain. It's greater than my sickness. It's greater than my sin. We just have to look at Jesus. I want to ask you if you'll stand with, on your feet with me this morning. The message of healing is the message of salvation. They're one and the same. Jesus came, he died, he rose again to save you. That means to restore and heal you to your perfect condition, to where God meant for you to be and to live. When I asked earlier, how many of you were in physical, any kind of physical pain today? Hands went up all across the room. But the healer is here. He's here right now. He's here right now. Do we trust him? Will we receive him? You have faith. Don't be condemned. Don't think, oh man, some people are healed. Why am I struggling to receive this? Listen, that's not what Jesus came to do. It's not what this message is about today. This message is about you understand that my healing has arrived. My healing has arrived. My salvation has arrived. Jesus came and it's here for me. I just have to receive it. I just have to get the doubt out and focus on him so hope can arise in my heart. I want to ask you to bow your head and to close your eyes right now. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your healer, as your savior, as your Lord, man, he died for you. He loves you. Maybe you've been wrestling with it, but hope has arisen in your heart today. I believe the day is the day for your healing. The day, today is the day for you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you and you say, yes, I want to be saved, healed, made whole. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand right now? We want to see a simple prayer of faith with you. Amen. Amen. Just lift up your hand right now. Amen. Thank you for that hand. Amen. If you're online, we want to pray with you as well. There's a button in the chat and we have people that want to pray with you, connect with you. And church, I'm going to ask you when we pray for salvation, 
Salvation is healing. So I want everyone to join in this. And if you raised your hand earlier, you're suffering from sickness, pain, injury, any infirmity in your body, I want you to lift up both hands. We're going to pray right now, and I believe people are going to walk out of this room totally and completely healed today by the stripes of Jesus. Amen. Are you ready to receive? He loves you so much. Your healing's arrived. You have it. You can be healed right now. It's just receiving it. It's just experiencing. God's already done it. You just got to receive. You just got to trust him. Let's pray this together. Say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I want to be healed. I want to be whole. I want to be saved. So I come to you. I trust you. I put my faith in you. I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe he rose from the dead. And I give Jesus my heart by faith right now in Jesus' name. Lord, heal me. I receive it and I will walk in it today by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Let's praise God for the healing that just took place. Who's going to pray a little bit more this week? Who's going to pray a little bit more this week? I will. Expectantly. Yes. Awesome. Well, hey, if you raised your hand today, made a decision today, a uh, couple things. We've got a resource for you out in Guest Central. That is the desk that you saw as you were coming into the sanctuary this morning. Also, I want for those who did make a decision today, or maybe you've made a decision to follow Christ in the past and haven't yet taken the opportunity to be publicly water baptized. That is in two Sundays from today, the 21st. Go to freedomhouse.cc slash baptism to save your place. I want to see these lines. I want to yeah. see them backed yeah. up, church. And I want to see Come the on. men up front. I want to see the men going first. Come on. Yeah. Also, if you're a first-time guest, we also have a resource for you at that same spot at Guest Central. And then um, every month we like to present you with resources that go with the, with the sermon series. So uh, this month we've got two books, Christ the Healer and then Healing the Sick. You'll see those. Um, you can get those at Salt Resources out in the lobby. And you guys are dismissed. Have a great week. Have a great week.